It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, our group is involved in a number of uh, mobile health projects, and I'm going to focus my comments on mobile health. Um, we're involved in projects with companies in uh, well-being, uh, in keep helping people stay engaged with mobile health. Uh, we're involved with uh, Kaiser. Kaiser wants to uh, have an aftercare for uh, patients who've had bariatric surgery, and how do you prevent them from reaching the after after state? <laughs> um, we're also involved in NIH-funded studies, uh, Heart Steps and Sarah. This is about substance abuse. I'll use both uh, Heart Steps and Sarah to uh, illustrate the ideas as we go through this short talk. So uh, what is our goal? Our goal is to use data to address these types of questions that arise in mobile health. So first, pools. In mobile health, you have this, you normally have a variety of intervention contact, content on the phone or on a wearable, and the individual, the user, decides whether or not they want to access that content. If they do decide to access the content, how do we present it to them so that they find it mo their most receptive? I'll give you an example of this uh, on the next slide. And how should that presentation differ by the current context the user is in, the current weather, uh, their level of stress, uh, the social environment they're in? How should whether or not how we pre present con uh, intervention content, content differ by this context? And then there's mobile health pushes. Now, mobile health pushes are, can be highly iatrogenic because they happen in the real, uh, in your real life. You, your wearable vibrates or your phone audibly pings and you're interrupted. So you really want to be careful with mobile health pushes. They can help you people a lot, but they can also disengage people at a very rapid rate. So here's... Um, so when should a mobile health or a device, like a smartphone or a wearable, interrupt you and try and provide support? And how should that vary by the current context, the time of the day, the day of the week, whether you're at home or work, how you're feeling at the time, the social con context that you're in? So here are some uh, concrete examples. Uh, Heart Steps is an intervention. It's a set of three uh, trials that we're involved in, um, and the second trial is uh, for people who've had a heart attack, and we're trying to help them in their recovery. Um, main, and they've gone through an intensive outpatient program, and we want to help them stay active. So when the user goes to the phone to track their exercise, how do you present messages to the user? And I gave you, here I have two different examples of how you might present the message. Uh, one would be um, focusing a message that's more about the future, about living to see your children have children themselves. Another totally different type of message is acknowledging how far I've come as a user. When is it useful to provide one or the other type of message to um, the person? And does that differ by the con context of the individual at that time? Um, and since to stop, this is another mobile health study that we're involved in. This is uh, smoking cessation. Uh, as you probably realize, uh, stress is one of the a big factor in uh, relapse to smoking. Uh, and so uh, one of the things you want to do is you want to provide a training and a, a variety of stress management exercises, and then people can practice them in their real life. Should you push reminders to people to practice those exercises, at times they're at high physiological stress. Maybe not such a good idea. Should it be at times that they're not physiologically stre stressed? And where should that, you know, should it be in a social context or when they're alone and so on? Uh, here's uh, a, another type of push and pull, and that's about engagement. So we not only have therapeutic pulls and therapeutic pushes, we also want to think about intervention engagement. So in the top, uh, Sarah is a, a research assessment tool that's uh, for kids that are at high risk uh, for substance uh, use uh, and drinking. They, they're, recruit, they're already uh, in the high risk group, uh, children and uh, young adults. 
and we want to provide some engagement to them whenever they open the app. So should we show that um, their rewards by growing an aquarium which is moving fast and you see little bitty, you know, different kinds of fish and you can find out about your fish, you can level up. Um, or should we use something that is more sedate where you have a tree that grows and produces fruit? And should that vary by the individual? That's just a pull. So when they would go to their device, it's the first thing they would see on the, uh, on the face of the phone. A push, um, let me see here. I want to give you an example. This is also in Sarah for uh, young kids. Um, so we know that if we push too much, people will habituate to our messages, they'll start to ignore us, and they may, may even delete the app. But we want to provide some sort of reinforcers for them, giving us their perceived stress, reporting on their mood, and so on. So here's a, a, a uh, a message you, you might receive in the middle of the day for no reason whatsoever. I mean, it's just a little reward that might make you more feel like you want to help us out. And it's uh, an inspirational message from a, a famous pop star. Whether or not, should we give that? When should we deliver it? Will that have the impact of improving your self-report collect, data collection? So what does our, our group do? do? Um, this was, it was great. Justin Sly was just right on. Uh, it's all about having that whole cycle of intervention development. Oops, uh, how do I go backwards? There. Um, so so we, we have experiment, we design, we, ex we make our prototype, we experiment, and we go repeatedly through this between people. So I'll show you some examples of experiments shortly. Uh, we analyze the data after the experiment, we improve our app, and so on. And then there's the issue of how can we, as someone uses an app, continually update the app, tailor the app, personalize the app to that individual as they move through time. In that case, this is going on, this cycle is going on within an individual as opposed to between individuals. And I'll discuss that very briefly at the end of this um, talk. So what do we do? We're looking at how do you optimize these MF interventions? How do we use data to address the questions that I raised on the prior slides? How do we experiment to address those questions? to determine in which context we should provide a particular kind of push or pull. So here's uh, the um, uh, schematic of Sarah, the Substance Abuse Research Assistant. This is a 30-day study. Um, we're trying to engage young adults and uh, adolescents in, in a data collection, so we want to understand their perceived stress, their perceived mood. Of course, we also have a variety of sensor data streaming in that the individual doesn't have to, is not, is not burdened by. But this is uh, with respect to the burdensome part of the uh, app, that is the self-report. And uh, every day, uh, there's a variety of randomizations. Here I just have two. They're in green. So uh, the person goes through after they answer our uh, our questions, do we give them a reward? These are MIMS. They're, a lot of times they have visuals where things are happening and they make you feel good. This is after you uh, collect the data. If you collect the data, you might get a reward. Uh, in the middle of the day, you might get your inspirational message. Again, we want to know in what context is it worth it. So we're experimenting to determine that, to answer that question. Here's another study. This study is over. Um, this was the first of the three studies with heart steps, and this was with uh, sedentary people. The next two are, will be with people who had uh, uh, heart, a uh, heart attacks. So in this study, there was also a variety of, of uh, randomizations, questions we wanted to ask. Uh, I list two of them here. They're in green. You see the randomization. So this is a 42-day study. Every day, uh, the individual can be randomized up to five times a day. And around three of those five times on average, they may get a message. And this message is tailored to the current context, how cold it is outside, uh, whether they're at home or work, 
uh, whether it's a weekday or a weekend, and it gives you a, a, a message that's a physical activity message that is actionable in that moment. So it's about the moment they're currently in. And there were two types of physical activity messages we could provide in that roughly three out of five times. One was an anti-sedentary message, didn't require a lot of effort, um, maybe just roll your arms, stand up. The other required some effort, like oh, going for a very brief walk, walking to the furthest bathroom, for example. Uh, we also randomize in the evening um, where, where you plan your next day's physical activity. So how should we assist you in planning your next day's physical activity? What's the best way to do this? Um, so I'm going to, on the next slide, I'm going to give you an example of the kind of results that you might see if you ran this kind of study. We did, and these are some of the results. So what we found uh, was that um, providing a tailored activity suggestion did indeed, versus not providing a tailored activity suggestion, did increase uh, individuals, the user step count in the near time, in that 30 minute window after a, uh, one could or could not provide uh, a tailored activity suggestion. Quite interesting, um, those anti-sedentary messages, which the le literature suggests might be very helpful in getting you up, at least out of your chair, and then you might move. Quite in interestingly, we saw no impact of those whatsoever. It was only the messages that were a little bit more burdensome. Walk to the furthest bathroom. Walk until you see a squirrel. Park further away. Those types of messages. Um, that was very interesting. Furthermore, um, a, a big concern when we were running this study was the issue of habituation and burden. And unfortunately, our concerns bore out. At the beginning of the study, um, we saw an increase in step count of around 271 steps. This is really big in this setting. Uh, sedentary individuals get around 250 steps in a 30-minute window. So this is a doubling, essentially, of their step early. By three weeks into the six-week study, it's dissipated. Habituation. They're not even seeing the messages. So in the next study, we're heading into the next heart step study. We're going to uh, allow users to have vacations from the messages so that they can dishabituate and hopefully they'll be more receptive again when they come back in. We also um, looked at the different ways to structure, your, uh, help people set goals or plan their activity for the following day. That also was quite interesting. It turns out it really helps, pe helps people uh, to plan their activity for weekdays. We were able to help them. But when they wanted to plan their activity for a weekend, the messages that we gave them were of no use whatsoever. Very interesting. So in the next study, the types of planning we um, instigate will be more for the weekdays. Um, and we have to think about how can we do something different for the weekends. This is just an example of the kind of results you might see. Um, so the challenges, uh, Justin asked us to discuss challenges. And in mobile health, uh, when we're thinking about closing the loop, that is, using the sensor data, using self-report data to provide uh, treatments such as these little behavioral messages or social messages or uh, cognitive uh, messages, all types of ways that we can provide support to an intervention, I see these as um, really big challenges at, uh, for uh, us in the data science field. So we can measure the context with our sensors. We can get an enormous amount of information on the individual. We can get their physiological stress. We can uh, see, we can um, sample the audio, in a, the audio environment to see if they're in a social context. We can look at the sentiment of their text messages. We know the weather outside and so on. We have lots of measures of their current context, but we'll never get everything. So. Uh, might the best treatment pull or push? 
for a given context, the context that we're able to record with our sensors, still vary by user? And if so, how do we discover that with our data analytics? So this is not uh, varying by, it's only you notice it by how the user responds to your message. Um, could it be, you and I know, particularly in psychiatry, that people are not the same one year to the next. A year from now, I'm going to be a different person. So it makes perfect sense that right now, the kind of messages perhaps maybe I would really benefit from uh, reframing when I have a lapse to smoking right now. But in a year from now, I may not benefit as much from a, a reframing. Maybe I need uh, an alternate behavior to help me manage, to take my mind off the fact that I had a lapse. That might be more useful in future. So we want to have algorithms that are internal to our software that allow us to change the types of pushes or pulls as the individual progresses with time. So that's a dynamic stratification, one might say. Indeed, um, what we want to do is we want our intervention that will be on the mobile device, part of that intervention will be an algorithm. And in that algorithm, that algorithm will continually learn so uh, about the individual to learn, well, maybe a push that I was provided now is no longer useful a month later, even though the context to the sensors looks pretty much the same. We want that type. So our treatment, this is totally cool if you're a data scientist, uh, our treatment package, part of it will be an algorithm that continually learns and updates the intervention to the person. These are the challenges that I see coming up. It's, uh, as uh, Justin said and uh, Scott before, it's incredibly exciting. I just want to have pictures of a lot of the people that are on our team. Uh, thanks very much.